Yes, good afternoon to all. Uh, I welcome you all for this uh, uh, second technical session of Smart Beekeeping, International Workshop on uh, Smart Beekeeping. Uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Tierney, co-organizing secretary, to introduce the speaker. Good afternoon, all. With pleasure, would like to address the speaker, Dr. U. E. Anwarirad Srisena, Head, Department of Plant Science from Rajaratna University of Sri Lanka. His field of research for beekeeping, insect taxonomy, particularly hemiptera, the management of agricultural pests and disease, and biological control of insect pests. He is presently deputy proctor and chairman of Needy Scholarship Committee and coordinator of Career Guidance Unit and, student, and chairman of Subcommittee of Annual Research Symposium, etc. He offered a many training programs for farmers, beekeeping, pestern disease control also conducting IPM training programs under the peace project for paddy farmers. He handled the many projects like beekeeping project, present coordinator of ahead projects, an expertise in Bombarder Conservation Project, etc. Entomological Society of America also acts as a guest lecturer for various universities. Nearly 46 publications, he has yet till now still working as a BCB. Now I hand over the section, Dr. to Anura Indrajit Srisena. Welcome, sir. We are going yearly expecting your great lecture on designing of theory, complementary feeding. Once again, and welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Am I audible enough? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, let me share my presentation first and. I hope you can see the presentation, right? Hello? Can you see the presentation? Sir. All right. Uh, yes. Thank you, very, thank you very much for inviting me for this um, workshops, uh, the webinar series. And I did actually, I'm very glad to um, participate uh, in this um, event. And um, Ms. Uh, Dr. Muthukumar, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and thank, thanks for the nice introduction as well. So um, I saw that uh, we have uh, already had a very good session in the morning uh, related to beekeeping, uh, uh, epiculture. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't attend or, or in the morning sessions uh, as I had some other meetings to uh, attend. So anyway, uh, now, uh, I, as I understood, uh, most of the students from the Department of Entomology of uh, you know, universities uh, participating in this program, in this uh, um, uh, lecture. So actually, uh, we also have a similar um, kind of um, uh, department and, and we also have a beekeeping or epiculture course here. Uh, uh, my students are also uh, very interested uh, about this sort of thing, uh, workshops, but probably tomorrow they will join uh, Provided that your with your permission, they will uh, join in in the workshop in time to come. So uh, today, actually, I'm going to talk about uh, designing of an apiary and supplementary feeding of honeybees. Um, actually, um, as far as I know, the beekeeping is a very good uh, industry in, in your country, uh, in compared to our country. But uh, the things are different uh, between your country and our country. Maybe the may, the tools, the techniques, and things may be different. It's always uh, we have we exchange the the ideas and the techniques uh, as uh, our uh, most neighboring country. Um, it, it is very good if we can exchange our knowledge. 
So I think this is a great opportunity for both of us. And um, uh, if I uh, roughly tell you the content of my this, uh, speech today, it's, uh, I will uh, discuss first about introductions of uh, bees of Sri Lanka, just to give some uh, um, understanding about Sri Lankan bee fauna and the bees and foraging plants, what is their uh, relationship and designing of an apiary and what are the factors Suppose if we want to uh, uh, start a kind of uh, apiary, right? So uh, the things that we have to uh, consider at early stage and uh, supplementary feeding, uh, you, you know, and sometimes we have to give some food for them because uh, uh, the, the flowers or the nectar and pollen sources may not available in the environment or throughout the year. So uh, during the dearth period, so we have to uh, treat uh, with some food and uh, I will explain how actually we are doing that here. So at the discussion, maybe we can uh, have some uh, two way uh, kind of conversation or dialogue. So then um, uh, actually you are very familiar uh, with the bees, right? So they are um, importance, you know, bees pollinate around uh, 70 of uh, the 100 most important crop species that we use as food. And uh, so bees strongly influence ecological relationship and ecosystem conservation, stability, genetic variations of and plant community, floral diversity and our and without bees, you know, um, there may no any flowering plants, right? And then there may no any food. And if there are no any flowering plants, um, we cannot expect bees also to uh, sustain. And um, without bees, the biodiversity would not be so great. And there would be no yields, actually, no harvest for us to consume. So uh, we always uh, should uh, understand that we have to conserve bees. You know, the present day uh, agricultural practices are more uh, uh, harmful for the bees. Actually, I'm glad to see some of your speakers going to talk about maybe tomorrow uh, the effect of neonicotinide type uh, pesticide uh, on bees. Actually, uh, it's very, very nasty. I mean, uh, neonicotinides are very bad for the bees. So they, they may not be able to find their way back to their hive where so they, they get out for their foraging. So if they're exposed to neonicotinoid, so it's therefore it's very important. So uh, I will also uh, um, uh, plan to. Um, join that workshop, I mean, uh, as a participant. And then uh, if you think about bees of Sri Lanka, so we have many bee species in Sri Lanka, around 159 bee species are there. And they are belonging to so these uh, four families, Apidae, Collectidae, and Melhalictidae, Megachalidae, and yeah. There are solitary bees as well as, as, well as uh, social bees, especially this uh, Vijay Sekar and Karuna uh, they are working on Sri Lankan bees very well. And uh, I also have conducted some uh, projects on uh, bee diversity in Sri Lanka. So we have many solitary bees and uh, social bees we also we have. So you can see some of the bee species that we have, uh, that you can find very commonly here in our part of the uh, continent, right? And the honeybees uh, in Sri Lanka, you can mainly find three species. Apis serana, uh, Apis dosata, and Apis floria. As we don't have Apis millipera here in Sri Lanka, we don't have. We have only Apis serana. Apis dosata is the the giant bee, you know that. And uh, but for the beekeeping, we use uh, only the Apis serana. Uh, we don't have Apis dosata here in Sri Lanka, but I understood that uh, you you uh, use Apis dosata also for the. Uh, beekeeping. Uh, I don't know whether I'm correct. So we'll see at the, at the end. Then Epis floria is also kind of um, a species that we commonly have, especially Jaffna Peninsula area. And uh, there are some two uh, stingless honeybees also, uh, in stingless uh, honeybees in Sri Lanka, the bee species. Uh, but mainly we, as I uh, told you earlier, Epis serana uh, is the one that we use in the, in the beekeeping. Um, and these are the, they are nesting habits. So if it's Floria, you can see uh, there's a single comb and they covered, um, they normally uh, uh, produce their nest uh, in out exposed areas, right? And, but uh, in contrast to that, you know, the Mibi or the Episerana, they, they always go for concealed or um, very closed environments, right? And maybe termite mold or maybe kind of um, a cave or whatever right there. And they, they may uh, several, they develop several parallel combs, right? And in, in contrast to that, again, the giant bee Apis dosata may produce only one uh, uh, large comb. And uh, yeah, uh, if you come to uh, Sri Lanka, you will see uh, many places, and especially in the buildings, right? So they are nesting, and sometimes uh, people consider it as a pest. 
So now uh, thinking as a pest, they, they try to destroy also. Actually, I am actually engaging in, in um, conserving uh, Epis dosata because people set fire into them thinking that they are kind of harmful uh, uh, organisms. It's a very unfortunate situation. Anyway, now um, we, uh, there is a pollinate, pollinator uh, conservation front in Sri Lanka. So we, as, uh, as a committee, we, we are nationally, we are engaging on, in um, conserving these dosata, especially uh, sea giria like places, I think uh, sometimes you may have heard about uh, in Sri Lanka, the, the Bambara bees is very, very popular in the sea giria area. And um, if you think about honey uh, hunting in Sri Lanka, actually, it is, uh, not, it's not a kind of new things to our um, traditional people, you know, uh, in, in forest, we have some special Aborigine like, I mean, uh, people we call Vedda people, so they still live in uh, in forest related areas right so they were harvesting honey um, by uh, visiting different places in forest and their main uh, income source also uh, honey right uh, but i mean uh, this is the ancient side of our bee keep beekeeping actually it was it is not a beekeeping they just harvesting they go to uh, place to place and when they found any um, colonies they will uh, take or the harvest the honey. Then there is there is no sustainability there. Sometimes they destroy the colony as well, and uh, yeah. But uh, in modern day now, um, we are uh, having different types of um, beehives in Sri Lanka. So this is the uh, the metric box, uh, uh, detachable um, or movable uh, frames are there, right? So based on the Langstroth uh, box, so the, it has been modified to our Sri Lankan condition. Uh, Dr. Funchiheva is the one who that uh, developed this box. So uh, still you can see uh, honeybee colonies in Sri Lanka in, in places like this. I mean, uh, maybe in clay pots, right? And also some innovative people are producing different um, uh, hives uh, using different materials like some plant-based things you can see here. Uh, anyway, uh, what we have found here is they are very interested to uh, settle in a kind of uh, clay pots. Therefore, if you want to uh, catch a kind of swarming colony, what we have, what all I have to do, we have to keep this type of clay pots in, in different places in the, in your home garden, and then they will come and settle there. So then you can um, transfer them into a kind of um, a box like this. Um, and uh, in Sri Lankan beekeeping, uh, especially concentrated in four, four areas, I mean, uh, in this map, you can see some um, uh, green color patches, right, in different places. So these are the forest areas. So we have a few uh, forest patches. Actually, earlier there was more forest in Sri Lanka. Now it's only around 20 or just below 20. And um, it was 80% maybe sometime back, I mean, maybe... Uh, in, in 1880, it was, uh, we had 80% uh, forest coverage in the island, but now, unfortunately, due to different uh, development uh, programs, you can see only these are the uh, forests that we have remaining. Now, anyway, these areas, uh, you can, I mean, um, we can uh, do beekeeping. Uh, and also, you can see some red color patch here in the central highlands, right? So these are the eucalyptus zones. So lots of eucalyptus plants are available, what we call red gum zone also. So um, actually, our uh, Bee Research Institute uh, also uh, is, uh, is located here in this area, Bindurunava, Bandaravela, which is very uh, located in very high elevation in the country. So this is the central highlands of the, uh, on the island. And... Um, uh, then rubber zone. So you can see this uh, in yellow color, the rubber zone. So we have um, some rubber plantation. Under rubber plantation, uh, our farmers are doing beekeeping. You know, it's a very good uh, nectar source. Uh, again, kind of seasonality you can find because uh, of the wintering. So we have to stop um, and we have to move the colonies or we have to amalgamate the existing colony and have, we have to look um, um, during the death period. And the coconut triangle, so we have many coconut plantations as well. You know, coconuts are very good pollen sources for them. Um, and so under coconut cultivations, so our um, people actually rear bees. So these are the uh, different uh, four different areas that we are doing beekeeping. Um, in different levels and i think uh, you can hear me right so hello just to just to ensure that um, i'm audible also yes uh, you can uh, thank uh, you yeah yeah okay yeah. Th thank you thank you uh, then the designing of an apiary so when we want to uh, design a kind of apiary apiary meaning you know it's a place that we um, keep be uh, to scientific management in order to uh, harvest maybe 
Holland or Hani or Royal Jelly or whatever. So um, uh, uh, collections of bee colonies in, in a particular place, you know, we, we consider as an apiary. So uh, there are different aspects that we have to consider. So we have to think about the needs of the beekeeper. So what you exactly need. Right, so based on your requirement, we have to select the location, okay, and whether it is very close to your house or uh, whether any neighbors are uh, very uh, nearby, right, and whether you can easily access that place or whether the place is frequently disturbed by different different other factors, right. So the, we have to think about that when you are selecting a location. The resources, uh, whether you have all this beekeeping, actually we don't want very sophisticated uh, tools and equipment in beekeeping, but there are some essential items, you know, that we hire a smoker, right? So these things we need, uh, so and a kind of um, beware, right? Uh, actually, we don't want a, a kind of overcoat for, for handle be episerana because it's not that much aggressive, but if you are going to handle uh, epis dosata, maybe, maybe you need to uh, wear a kind of full of uh, 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 safety cloth because they can be very dangerous. Um, then the number of colonies, right? So how many colonies you want to maintain in your APR is also quite very uh, important. So if you are just take, uh, thinking of uh, one or two colonies, maybe in, in your home garden, you don't want to worry about uh, that much. But if you are going to keep about more than 20 or 30 or 50 or colonies in a kind of APR, then um, you have to uh, think uh, the, these aspects uh, as well. The need of the neighbors now, um, we should not, you know, if you are in a kind of center of a city or something like that, it is not fair for you to keep a number of colonies uh, in your home garden because it may be a uh, kind of disturbance for your neighbor. You know, during the night time, they attract to light and sometimes they, they, you know, they have their own behaviors. I mean, most of the time during the evening, they get uh, a kind of um, uh, uh, kind of restlessness, you know, uh, they will, they come out of their hive and they hang around uh, for some time and then again, they go back into the house. So if the neighbors are very nearby, so they will be uh, in trouble sometimes, right? If there are kids are playing somewhere, right? So they don't know what it is and things like that. And yeah, therefore, uh, we have to think about the environmental situation. And um, if it is very uh, disturbing area, like if somebody is setting fire all the time in the, in the area, particular area, it's not good for the bees, right? And uh, noise actually that not that much important because I have experienced uh, I had a spare, uh, kind of uh, apiary very close to railway road, right? So, but they they they, uh, they don't uh, get upset because of the noise because uh, it's not a problem. But uh, if you are applying a, a, a different pesticide uh, in your cultivated area and it is not a good place for keep the bees, right? So, uh, likewise, uh, you have to think about um, what is the situations in your neighbors and where, as well. And then the need of uh, bees. Now we have to think about the, from the bee side as well the population density, right? So the um, if you keep colonies very close, uh, each and uh, I mean, very closely, if you keep the hive, sometime it, there may be some competition for the food, right? So then, uh, and if you don't have enough food sources, uh, foraging plants uh, in the surrounding, right? So then the bees will be in trouble in finding nectar and pollen. And also uh, if there are some very stronger colonies and they will go for other colonies and do some rubbing and things. I think you have heard about these things. Uh, so they compete each other. So sometimes they attack each other, right? Therefore, um, uh, the, there is a kind of um, concern about the population density. So we have to think about based on the available resources, we have to decide how many colonies actually we can uh, keep. And uh, shade requirements, so bees love uh, to uh, be in a kind of shady uh, environment. So they, that's why they always go for concealed area for, uh, for make, uh, developing their nest, right? So um, therefore uh, we should not keep it in a very um, a light condition. So the shade requirement is there. Then the bee pasture and uh, foraging plants. So, um, so I will discuss about bee pasture and foraging later. And the water availability, so bees uh, require water, right? Therefore, there should be a kind of uh, sources nearby. Then hygiene in the area now, you know, when you keep several colonies in a single place, right? So there is a high chance for them to get infested for different diseases or different pests, you know, that wax moth and sometimes uh, brood diseases, right? So there may be different viral diseases are there. So um, if one colony is get um, infected, so right? So then in an apiary, it can be very quickly spread among the other, other colonies, you know, the colony collapse disorder in, in the in the European areas, right, countries, right? Uh, so it can easily spread. 
Therefore, you have to maintain the hygiene in the area. It's very important. Uh, now, if you have some old combs and things, uh, if you keep the, those here and there, the wax moths will attract them and then they will uh, attack the colonies. So therefore, uh, we have to uh, maintain the cleanliness of the environment definitely. Now, then in, in, if you are a, a beginner now, how when you are going to start beekeeping, so the suitable uh, site you have to decide first. The availability of plenty of flowering plants in the area is a very important factor. But um, if somebody asks whether we can't keep their colonies in a kind of city or something like that, still I say, no, we can, right? So even a flat, you can keep a kind of honeybee colony in my perspective, right? But we should uh, provide some sort of um, supplementary feeding and um, there may be some uh, big trees in, there, in, the, in, the, in the environment, right? So they can go and do foraging. So therefore, basically anywhere you can do beekeeping. But the thing is, uh, if you want to have maintain an apiary in large scale, so you have to uh, think about the other uh, aspect that I have already explained. Then there are no serious environmental problems nearby, such as uh, crops being sprayed with pesticide that we have already discussed. Then there should be a source of water nearby. Then hives should be shaded from strong sunlight. Then hives are not going to suffer from water dripping from overhead branches. Then uh, place the, them under shade trees in a greeny. Uh, green grassy area. So these things actually we have to think before you start, before you establish a, a new colony in, an, in a new environment. And um, when you are designing or when you are thinking of a site for a large scale apiary, so definitely there are something that we have to do, right? So we have to um, think about what kind of um, area that we have. Maybe we can have a kind of satellite images and we can uh, map Right, different land use pattern. Uh, what sort of um, land use planning are there? Right, I mean there may be some agricultural field. There may be some uh, with low vegetation trees and buildings, waters, and all, so on. Right, so we have to um, we have to map them. Right, and then we have to identify. So there may be some uh, places where the houses are located, home gardens are uh, available likewise. Now in a map like this, so these are actually a real map that we have been using uh, in our uh, for different projects. So this is some in North Central Province. So uh, I don't know whether you can see clearly. So in this map, you can see uh, in yellow color, you can see the chain of cultivation. Chain of cultivation is a kind of uh, traditional uh, farming system in Sri Lanka. And in uh, blue color, you can see the tank, right? Tanks and some uh, water reservoirs. And here in black color, dot I think these are the actually different homes. Uh, the home garden, the brown color, in brown color, you can see home garden, right? So likewise, we have to uh, categorize, right? By using some aerial maps. And uh, you may have to identify what are the ar suitable areas. Actually, in this green color, uh, you can see um, the forest, restrict restricted forest, uh, no, the paddy, paddy fields and the restricted forest area. So sometimes we may not able to go for these areas for beekeeping. Uh, therefore, we identify this chain of, chain of cultivations and these uh, home gardens, right? So those are the uh, most suitable areas, right? And uh, yeah, because uh, forest also uh, nearby, therefore bees can go and uh, collect nectar and pollen from the forest. So likewise, we have to identify suitable places. And this is another uh, another area you, sometime you may have heard about Singaraja Forest of Sri Lanka. It's a very big uh, forest reserve in Sri Lanka. So we, were, uh, we wanted to establish uh, a kind of um, uh, beekeeping, uh, or the apiaries, right, in uh, in the border of the Singharaja forest. So this is how we started it. And uh, now you can see where are the colonies that we have oral, already established uh, for the time being. And once you identify the areas, right, suitable areas, uh, then the next thing is we have to find uh, whether the for foraging plants or the pasture Right, are available for the bees, right? So the pasture survey is also important. You know, bees and flowers have a kind of intimate relationship. So you need, they always collect pollen as the protein source, sorry. And they collect nectar as their carbohydrate source. So their mouth part, I think uh, you had a good uh, kind of uh, speech in the morning about the biology of bees. So per perhaps you may have uh, went through these things and they have a kind of, uh, a mouth parts like that, uh, which is um, lapping type mouth parts they have. So this is how actually they store um, uh, pollen, right? So pollens are their protein source. So they normally they they uh, feed their youngs or larvae by using uh, bee bread. 
for the for making bee bread uh, they use this pollen actually we we also can consume it directly it's very highly nutritious you know that and um, uh, when we want to do a kind of pasture survey or the foraging survey right we have we should identify what sort of plants available in the identified areas right now for that actually what we did um, we um, uh, uh, we visited the areas and uh, we observed right whether the particular uh, the plants are bee plants or not right actually sometimes some flowers are there the, the bees come and just stay and they uh, they may rest and they go again so in such sort of plant we cannot identify as a bee plant right there should be some time now they have to spend on bees some uh, considerable time actually so therefore we actually um, uh, spend about 15 minutes in in, in a particular plant and uh, two times of a day we used uh, for the observations right and um, then um, we recorded uh, whether uh, the particular plant is a bee plant so not whether they collect nectar or pollen uh, from a particular plant and then uh, we can do some pollen analysis also right so if in the identified plant you can collect some pollens okay and we can preserve pollens and also we can collect uh, the pollens from the colonies also right so you can see one of my two of my students are collecting pollen for the experimental purpose and we can extract pollen and um, then we can make some pollen slides right and we can do some pollen analysis as well so here we can see how we can see um, after staining right um, you can see different types of pollen uh, and under under hemocytometer you can uh, ident you can even um, the measure their abundance right then you can compare right and uh, now you have already collected pollen from the plants and you collected pollen from the uh nectar sorry um from the pollen uh of the colonies as well therefore now uh, now you know they have very uh peculiar shapes the pollen have any plant species have a very peculiar shape right morphology by the comparing all those things actually we can uh we can confirm this is a bee plant or not and how how far they collect that one right so we can easily enumerate that one and you can statistically compare right so this is actually some finding of some uh, such students um now according to he, uh, his um, research you can see uh, these are the plants that they have mostly uh, collected uh, during foraging um so um yeah and then uh, you can compare um, uh, the availability of flowers actually in the area, right? So you can see the temporal variation as well as spatial variation, right? How many plants available for, uh, in a particular area, right? And uh, how the, the flower availability is changed over time, right? Then based on this data, you can develop a kind of calendar, what we call pollen calendar. Right now, we are developing. Uh, we have been developing pollen calendars for different areas, actually, in the in the for the moment in the country. Now, likewise, February, March, like we have to continue. Maybe uh, one year. Start, it should be a one year study at least, right? Then you can record uh, what during what period, right? So acacia, uh, the this plant. So now you can see during this time, right? Uh, the flowers are available. Likewise, if you have a pollen calendar like this, so then you can recommend. Okay, now this area is good for the beekeeping. So now these are the uh, foraging sources that uh, available already in the in particular area right now if there are some deficiencies now we can introduce some other plants from the outside also right so so this is the basic idea that we um, actually we were doing uh, before we establish a kind of apiary in a particular area and excuse me and uh, here you can see some of the results of uh, the bee visitation now uh, we have now uh, there's an apiary from the upcountry areas also now very close to uh, um, tea lands right now we had some exotic uh, flowering plants also there then we wanted to uh, check whether um, these plants are good uh, foraging plants or not then uh, we we just uh, got the bee visitation data and accordingly we could uh, uh, finalize okay these are the very good plants uh, likewise so this sort of uh, basic uh, information we can collect before we uh, starting a kind of apiary before we design in a kind of apiary and uh, in a particular place right so if you want to have a kind of apiary again we can design our garden basically right we can design our garden so bee, bees are dependent on plants uh, for their food as we discussed earlier so they they, they demand nectar and pollen Therefore, uh, this early uh, survey, pasture survey, we can do, and we can develop the pollen calendar as well. 
and uh, you know how they collect pollen. So actually, I don't want to discuss this thing in detail. Uh, so this is how they collect after they collect bees you uh, they are they are pollen baskets are full of pollen like this right so they have a corbicula pecten and all these the oracle and things uh, the, uh, very well adapted legs they have for collections of um, uh, pollen and you can see uh, normally honeybees um, all they are i mean uh, even eyes are covered with different types of uh, hairs right some hairs are branched there are maybe some unbranched hairs right so whatever it is so they they trap uh, pollens when they are uh, hanging around flowers, right? So these pollens are land on their body and they're trapped uh, in these uh, hairs. And then they, they can, uh, by using their pollen comb, they can easily scrape them out. And they don't waste any pollen and they will uh, stack them in their pollen basket. And then they, after return to hive, they uh, store them in their um, hive. Then flowering throughout the year is very important. Now, if you have, uh, now when you are designing your apiary, right? If you want to establish some uh, flowering plant, so you have to think, right so some sort of flower should available maybe the same plant may never uh, flower throughout the year then you can select some plant now this is for example antigona right so most of the time you can find some flowers in this one. and um, so likewise you can have a kind of combination good combination right in your apiary you can uh, develop some uh, you can establish some sort of uh, flowering plants like that to ensure year-round flower production they're free from pesticide now as i told you at the beginning now you uh, should not select a kind of place uh, uh, if, if, it, if it is a kind of intensively uh, cultivated area. Now if the farmers are highly depend on the um, agrochemicals, right? This actually this is not a good area for to, to uh, select for a period at all. Then perfect shape. Now sometimes honeybees mostly prefer flowers with easily accessible nectar, especially uh, the family Asteraceae, right? I found that the family asteraceae is very uh, helpful for them, right? Rather than having a very big uh, kind of flowers, right? Especially here in our part of the country. I mean, we have a special uh, weed called um, a tridex, right? I don't know whether it is available in your New York country. Now, tridex comes. Now, it's a very good bee plant, right? Now, now we are uh, now when uh, flowers. Uh, none of the plants are having flowers uh, in dry season, so you can see uh, flowers in this wheat, right? So now it is dry season here in Sri Lanka. Now, lots of uh, tridex have flowers, right? So I can see in the morning, uh, lots of uh, dosatas and different types of bees are um, visiting this wheat, right? So uh, it's a very good dry, I mean, um, uh, dry tolerant wheat. Uh, so they, they produce nice flowers for the bees in during the drought period, right? Then the blooms at the right time, now some, you know, some uh, plants uh, bloom during the night time. So there are no use for the bees then, right? Uh, but some, uh, one of my friends actually told me that the dosata is collecting uh, nectar and pollen during the night also, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. I have never seen that. Uh, anyway, now uh, the flowering plants has to flower during the daytime if you are using in this uh, apiary, right? And fragrant flowers, so these are kind of exotic type uh, flower, uh, flowering plants, so nasturtiums, right, sweet smelling. Now it's very good, at, I mean, very good bee plants in our uh, high elevation, right? So we found that uh, lots of bees are um, visiting these plants for the variety. And uh, some plants actually uh, are good pollen pollen source, especially coconut, right? And finger millet like things, And um, but uh, some plants may be good nectar source. Now, um, in designing your uh, apiary, you can have both, right? So a combination of nectar and pollen sources you can establish uh, in your apiary or, or, or you can establish apiary where these uh, uh, flower sources are available. And uh, yeah, so, uh, maize, uh, finger millet, sesame is a very good uh, uh, plant, bee plant, right? And these are different um, bee plants we can find in uh, our country, mustard, long bean, um, and then a groundnut, soybean, and then um, uh, ornamental plants. Now, the senior is again very good um, uh, bee plant in our country, right? Uh, then sunflower, again, uh, uh, nasturtiums, Mexican plant, sunflower, marigold, rose. And lots of weeds. So this antigonon is, uh, you can see in roadside, right? So it's a very good bee plant throughout the year. You can find um, uh, flowers in this vine. And uh, mimosa fudica is a kind of, um, again, weed. And small uh, grasses, right? So they also uh, go good um, flowering, sorry, um, foraging uh, plants. 
Now, this is the one that I told you earlier. So the, the tridex, right? So the tridex is very good uh, uh, bee plants in the dry zone of the country. Uh, so throughout the year, you can see some um, flower. And um, so this is uh, perennial uh, uh, fruit crops uh, that we can find in the country. And um, avocado, mango, banana, citrus, guava, cashew nut, and kamranga, strawberry, right? And um, yeah, the plantation crops, like as I said earlier, coconut, right? And rubber, it's a very good nectar uh, source we can find in... Uh, uh, in rubber and uh, sometimes I, I think you also have the same experience about tea now uh, actually tea also very good uh, bee plant because i have established of apiary right in the center of a, of a, uh, of a tea land i will show you some images uh, because no one identify i mean in our part i i our country it's not recognized as a as a bee plant right mm -hmm. but uh, i i actually prove now we can have we can maintain some some uh, honeybee colonies uh, uh, in uh, 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 even uh, in a honeybee colon. Uh, please give me a one minute. Uh, I'm sorry for the disturbance. Uh, and then, uh, yes. Uh, then, uh, so these are some uh, apiaries we can find in co under coconut uh, cultivations. So we have uh, people uh, uh, having colonies and because it's uh, not only for the honey, actually honey production for the, you know, the pollination purpose also is very good. So the productivity of coconut uh, uh, is very high when you have colonies in uh, under co coconut cultivations. Then in rubber plantations, uh, you know, um, most of the time we can keep rubber uh, colonies under rubber cultivation, but during the winter in time, we have to um, uh, bring the colony for another place or we have to do some supplementary feeding. And uh, that is the what that is what I had told you earlier. So, so this is a kind of uh, tea cultivation, right? So we had uh, several colonies uh, here in the center of this tea cultivation. Um, but one, one thing that we did actually, uh, we didn't uh, remove any weeds. We didn't remove any weeds of these tea lands uh, because there are different weed species that can, can serve as a uh, bee plant, right? So uh, maybe not. Uh, maybe the, the the tea plants may not give enough uh, nectar or pollen for them. But the but the weeds, right? Uh, but I don't uh, recommend to keep weeds uh, throughout the field. Then it will uh, affect on the productivity of the tea cultivation but you know the in the especially in the drains and the barns like thing right so we can keep some wheat right so uh, actually we get we got a very good harvest from this uh, 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 apiary and i'll still be having that one and it is located in central highlands right so very cold uh, uh, climate we have there in contrast to uh, the dry zone and forest cultivation now uh, we have very specific kind of uh, wines or the plants uh, the color well or the what you call dairies, right? Dairies, and you will find flowers only for a one season. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, one uh, maybe one or two weeks per year, right? And during this time, uh, lots of honey production I can expect uh, during uh, the, that season. And uh, yeah, it's a very good bee plant, right? And cohamba neem, I think you are very familiar with the neem, so also good plant. And the tamarind, now when the tamarind has a flower in there, so our, uh, the, the, the taste of the honey also in that, the tamarind uh, taste, right, it's very interesting. So people are like to buy uh, honey uh, during that season because of the special flavor of that uh, honey. <clears throat> Then the shade plants, now especially in tea plantations and other cultivation, we have some slow shade and high shade plants, right? And especially eucalyptus, uh, high, high shade plants, right? And glyricida likes low, low shade plants. Uh, so these are also uh, kind of very good uh, foraging plant that we can establish in our apiaries, right? Maybe uh, in the uh, as in a kind of alley crop or the in the, in the as a hedge crop, we can uh, establish these uh, uh, plants. 
Right now, um, uh, how many colonies per APR? Now, that's a, a kind of basic question that we have asked at the beginning, right? Now, you know, in Episerana, normally their foraging distance is around uh, 300 meters, right? So they go for the foraging about 300 meters. Now, that um, is... Uh, now, in this case, the, it's not necessarily that uh, you have to keep uh, uh, the colonies 300 apart, right? Now, you can keep colonies very close uh, distance, maybe two meter, three meter distances in each other, right? Uh, provided that if you have enough uh, foraging uh, resources, as I said earlier. Uh, and you can see what water reserve, water um, supply, we may need to uh, give some uh, water also for the apiary. And um, here are uh, some example for the APR. Actually, not uh, all are from our country. Now I got these things from different other other uh, uh, countries also. So many uh, many uh, hives you can keep in a single place, but it, there should be enough uh, foraging uh, resources, right? Or oh, otherwise, as somebody have done about migratory beekeeping in the morning, maybe he have already uh, explained about that. So if the flowering or the foraging sources are not available, you can keep this. Uh, Colonies from one place to the other. Actually, this migratory beekeeping is uh, practiced in Sri Lanka also. You know, in um, uh, I know some of the beekeepers they spread their colonies among the peoples in the village, right? And they don't keep colonies in a one particular home garden. Rather, they they distributed their colonies in different different home gardens, right? Although it is located in different home gardens, uh, the other colonies by own one person. And uh, when the flowers are not available in these home gardens, they, they bring these colonies to another places, right? So it's a it's the way that um, uh, now uh, we do migrate beekeeping. But I can remember when I was USA, right? So they had a very big uh, industry in beekeeping. So they do migrate beekeeping in, uh, in large extent. They, they bring all these uh, colonies uh, into totally, I mean, especially in California, right? Um, they, uh, when the one particular plants have uh, flower they bring all the colonies there and actually the the owners of that uh, cultivation orchard they have to pay for the beekeeper to bring their colonies there so they are very rich uh, uh, i mean they earn lots of money by uh, doing this migratory beekeeping and i'm glad in india also they uh, i i'm i'm pretty sure you are doing migratory beekeeping in to great in greater extent um now um, in our part actually uh, normally we establish colonies in a like uh, stand like this right so in the bottom uh, you we keep normally a, a small pond like thing just to repel ants right so it's ants a very serious problem in our country and termites all sometimes and we cannot apply any uh, you know pesticide here because then it will affect on the bees also uh, but you can keep a, a kind of a structure like this then um, uh, now, if we, if the colony is very strong, they can fight with ants and they can stand. But the problem is, uh, if the colonies are weak, especially uh, Echopila sparagmina, the red ant, right? The, so they will come and attack the colonies. Therefore, very diffi difficult to uh, uh, protect colonies. And uh, so, when you have such structures, you have to worry about the mosquito development also, right? So we have to put something into this water, maybe kerosene or salt, uh, in order to um, stop uh, developing this mosquito larvae and all. And um, right, uh, then uh, when we think think about the bee cycle, so we, we can identify two cycles, the three cycle mainly, the growth period, honey flow period, and dearth period. Actually, this uh, honey flow period and dearth period uh, uh, you can find in, uh, in alternate um, seasons in tandem, right? So during the honey flow period, that's when we are, uh, the flower, flowers are available in the environment. And then the dearth period means they are, you cannot find enough flower, and the, especially the dry season. And um, now during the dearth period, actually, it's very difficult to maintain the colonies. Now, if you have a large number of colonies, uh, actually, we cannot expect any harvest also during the dearth period. So therefore, we have to amalgamate, or we have to join, or we have to... Uh, um, uh, merge some colonies and then we can uh, maintain as single colony. Maybe two weaker colonies we can merge and uh, as a single colony and you can keep as a single colony. And also um, uh, during this time because of the uh, lack of enough food, the colony become weak and the most of the time wax moth uh, attack uh, is also occurred during the dearth period. So therefore we have to uh, look after the colony uh, very well during the dearth period. Right, and one uh, uh, another thing that we have to think about actually during the heavy rain season also. Uh, uh, similar thing, uh, 
can happen um, i mean they, during the heavy rain season also the bees cannot go out for the foraging then again they are starving so we have to put some supplementary feeding actually um, during the dry season or the dearth period uh, the abscondin i think you are familiar with this Uh, during the uh, dearth period, you can uh, um, observe absconding. I mean, totally uh, escaping of a colony from the original uh, site, right? It's uh, it's different from the swarming. Actually, you know, swarming is a kind of reproducing colonies, right? So during the flowering season, I mean, during the honey flow season, we can find the colonies are swarming, right? So they divide colony themselves and they produce more uh, new queens and they they. They produce, I mean, uh, the new colonies will uh, add into the environment. Uh, but absconding means they, they totally, they totally um, uh, leave the places from their original nest and settle somewhere else. Now, uh, during the dearth period, the wax moth is the one re reason for that. And uh, low availability of forage also may be another problem for that. Now, if you, if you want to uh, stop this absconding, definitely we have to do some... Um, uh, supplementary feeding. That's why I uh, wanted to talk about supplementary feeding also uh, for the bees, especially during the dearth period. Now, whatever the apiary, whatever the uh, plant species you have in your apiary, uh, you need to do some um, uh, uh, supplementary feeding also. Actually, some some people think uh, you now giving this ne nectar, I mean, sugar solution is not good. Uh, then uh, bees become uh, lazy or something like lethargic or something. Like that. But uh, there's no truth in it, but definitely we have to give some uh, supplementary feeding. Uh, otherwise, um, they are under stress. Now, in Sri Lanka, you can find different, different uh, things they have invented. I mean, uh, homemade product, I mean, some clay pots, some plastic uh, leads, right? And you can see some food containers and even coconut shells you can use for this purpose, right? And uh, to make the sugar syrup, we use some very uh, clean hot water and we add uh, one to one um, sugar and hot water and we make the syrup. And you can use a, a structure like this also with the feeder, right? A bottle or a kind of plastic bottle with um, uh, sugar syrup. And um, we should not keep this sugar syrup for a long time. I mean, then uh, if they don't consume this one, so they can uh, ferment and right. So then it's not good if they consume after that. So maybe within two days or three days, you have to uh, replace that one. Actually, most of the time, they don't um, keep anything uh, remain. I mean, they consume all, right? So during the death period, you can see. And especially you have to put some uh, piece of uh, twigs uh, in a coconut, open um, shelf, something like that. Otherwise, they will die due to drowning, right? And uh, yes, uh, uh, you can keep the sugar syrup maybe inside or outside, but it is not recommended uh, for you to keep it outside because then the competition and attraction of other other species like bambara or different boss species, right? Those are like they will they also will come, and it's a kind of um, uh, uh, invitation for the troubles if you keep this thing in outside, right? Therefore, always it's recommended if you if you can keep the sugar syrup uh, within the hive, it's good. Um, yeah, and then uh, other, uh, now we can give some pollen substitutes also, right? Uh, in pollen substitute, we can use soya, uh, maize, and rice bran in in uh, in this um, ratios, right? So you can see um, you can make a kind of uh, dough uh, or kind of um, uh, slurry or something like that. Then uh, we can keep them on top of the frames and they will consume it, right? And uh, we have a product called summer posher. I don't know with the Definitely, you will have a, a similar product in, in the market, right? Which is contained maize, uh, rice bran, and soya flour, right? And uh, here you can see another. Um, so this uh, recipe uh, you can uh, again use, right? Um, so we mix with uh, sugar and uh, you can keep uh, there happily uh, feeding on this uh, pollen sauce. Actually, uh, this supplementary feeding is very important, as I told you earlier, just to maintain their, the, our, our colonies um, uh, during the dirt period. Otherwise, um, they will try to abscond and uh, the, the different pest attack also we can expect. Uh, I think I have, uh, okay, now this is how uh, we um, keep this summer force or this uh, pollen source, right, uh, in the, on the frame. Uh, and maybe within one or two days, they, they finish them all, right? 
and uh, what we should remember actually we have to clean the bottom uh, uh, board very uh, very often because otherwise the the remnants will be a kind of good source for the mites and other cockroaches and things can develop if you don't clean these things very um, often so these are the things actually i wanted to discuss today with you uh, i think you got some idea about how actually we can be beekeeping is doing in sri lanka up to up to some extent and uh, what are the the foraging plants you can find in our country and what are the basic thing that we have to do before you establish a apiary and what is the importance of doing pasture surveys and selection of a site uh, and uh, the maintaining colonies during the dearth period uh, by supplementary feeding uh, like this, uh, actually, um, uh, yeah, in, com in compared to Epis uh, millifera, right? Epis serana is not that much productive because it's small bee, uh, but still they are very uh, good because they don't that much susceptible for the varroa uh, mite and uh, they are somewhat uh, tolerant for the pest and other diseases also. In that sense, uh, Epis serana is good. Uh, actually, we tried some time back uh, to bring Epis millifera to our country, but uh, it is not right place for them here. Uh, so therefore, we have to depend on the Epis serana. Uh, so I think you got some idea about our uh, beekeeping. So if you have um, uh, any kind of uh, questions or any suggestions, right? So your or your own experience, uh, maybe similar things, so we can have a kind of discussion. Uh, I think so. Thank you very much. So I'm looking forward to some questions or any clarifications. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, nice presentation, sir. Um, uh, YouTube viewers uh, asking the question like, uh, share the tips to take care and the multiplication of stingless bees. Yes, sorry. Um, the questions from the YouTube viewers. Mm -hmm. uh, please share tips to take care and the multiplication of stingless bees. Um, uh, how to how to multiplication? Yes, stingless yes. bees. Is it the question? Actually, uh, stingless bees. Um, uh, we are not used in beekeeping in Sri Lanka. Actually, now uh, we we uh, we uh, we can uh, we can observe their colonies uh, here and there. Maybe different boxes or in, in their natural size. No one in the country actually use them as uh, for the beekeeping. Therefore, we don't have a kind of uh, technique. Uh, actually, it's very poorly studied area in Sri Lanka. So some of the students of mine actually did some surveys and uh, studies. And one student wanted to uh, have, develop kind of hive uh, to um, domesticate them. And uh, other than that, um, it, we commercially we don't do actually um, stingless bees. Hello, uh, sir. One more question from participant. Okay. Um, uh, how to develop the artificial diet for uh, bees? How to prepare artificial diet for bees? Ah, yeah, that, that one actually now I told, I, I showed you, uh, give me one second. Uh, yes. Um, so as I as I showed you earlier, now the the sugar and the soya flow, and um, uh, now I will show it again if required. Hello, yes, sir. Uh, uh, oh yes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so soya flow, maize flow, and rice bran we mix uh, together. I mean, uh, by using uh, uh, along with the uh, uh, sugar, and maybe we make with, with using uh, clean water, then make a kind of slurry, and then we just keep them on on top of the uh, hive. So that is how. Uh, oh, otherwise we can uh, we can use some commercially available uh, uh, food also in Sri Lanka. We have summer posture, tree posture. Likewise, uh, there are specific. Uh, uh, actually, kids' food, uh, we can use them also because we have tried several times and it was success. 
and uh, i can see a question say uh, um, to what may i use this uh, question myself uh, to what extent waxmoth problems in the eyes in sri lanka yes actually waxmoth is a serious problem in sri lanka now during the period um, sometime almost all the colonies are um, damaged by the uh, affected by the uh, wax moth so it's just, it's a one of serious problem in sri lanka nowadays actually we are trying to uh, find some um, uh, solutions that for that one uh, without application chemicals actually we were we were trying uh, applying some different types of smokes by using tobaccos and like things and um, uh, we 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 ask farmers to clean their uh, the the hive very uh, frequently using uh, warm water right and removing of all the combs and things are actually kind of effective things um, yeah wax moth is a very serious problem uh, in sri lanka sir have you seen the questions in chat box sir ah uh, yeah, yeah i can see uh, one is asking um, what are the good plants uh, available for coastal areas like that yeah actually it's a good question now in our our country in kalpitiya area you know that putlam area so we wanted to see um, whether there are some bee colonies and whether we can establish a, a kind of apiaries there unfortunately the most of the plants around the coastal belt actually not that much uh, good for the bee is i mean uh, yeah what all we can do is we can establish plant from, from outside maybe antigonan zinnias and uh, yeah some flowering plants we can establish uh, in, even in the coastal belt but my my question is whether that salty salty nature uh, will help for them to um, uh, i mean for the dosata it is okay now dosata we can find even in the central highlands and even in the coastal areas in trinco uh, and like wise but honey bees i really so in the coastal areas in the country uh, yeah uh, just in case if you want to uh, have colonies in the coastal areas you have to uh, establish some bee plant uh, bee plant or the foraging plant from the outside okay someone is asking uh, how to conduct how to conduct foraging survey on plantation crop aha uh -huh. what is the standard diet okay um, yeah how to conduct foraging survey on plantation actually when you want to do a uh, foraging survey as i told you um, so you have to document all the plant species first right in the area i mean the plantation uh, in your plantation go and see what are the plants available maybe coconut Uh, or some other plantation crop may be the major tree right but don't undermine i mean underestimate the weed that you can find uh, in the in the uh, ground right so these weeds are very important now sometime um, i mean weeds have flowers throughout the year right therefore when you when you are uh, making pasture survey the you have to include all the vegetation with the high high vegetation low vegetation or the the ground vegetation everything then you can document and go and see whether flowers are there then whether bees are visiting there right and in that way uh, you can make a kind of calendar as i told you earlier right so it is very effective uh, uh, so that is how actually we did our surveys then uh, someone is asking uh, another question um, what is the standard diet followed separately for the dearth period and monsoon sir okay yeah the, du during the during the monsoon actually uh, you know the colonies are under unrest because they can't go out therefore during the monsoon um, mostly what we are doing is uh, we giving some sugar syrup for our colonies sugar syrup only actually we didn't try uh, uh, pollen um, supplementaries there but during the dearth period we uh, we uh, we give uh, both sugar syrup as well as um, pollen substrate i mean uh, the the mixture that i have uh, explained earlier right so yeah flow and all uh And there's another question uh, okay we'll see what it is uh, mm -mm. how many uh, okay how many colonies in sri lanka just for cure history now someone is asking how many colonies in sri lanka i just I, actually it's a it's a very good question anyway 
now uh, uh, now no one have estimate how many colonies in in sri lanka i mean uh, yeah in compared to india actually the beekeeping is very primitive stage in sri lanka right now uh, that i have to tell you so we don't know actually how many colonies are even here available now uh, in in different locations we can find some farmers are keeping 40 colonies 50 colonies and some people keeping 150 colonies as well now they, they have some link with some companies uh, you know this uh, confectionery uh, i mean that uh, biscuit companies and something like that they they provide all the uh, the materials required and they buy all the honey from them actually i have to tell you most of the honey we still import right we we we, we do not produce enough uh, honey that we want for the self uh, use actually so uh, the main reason actually our species also have less productivity as i told you earlier so we are importing uh, honey uh, in every year um, um, yeah around 20% i think we produce and 80% we import so therefore our industry is not that much uh, i have to tell you that also actually and someone is asking uh, uh, let me see is there any fruit based syrup and flour ba flour based diet to improve the colony uh, actually uh, yeah some some people i have seen they they use some uh, fruit juices also instead of sugar syrup uh, some mango fruit juice likewise fruit juice also they uh, they are providing for their colony and also adulterated um, or diluted uh, honey also they use sometime uh, for the uh, for the feeding uh, not particular uh, uh, so syrup actually. Then someone is asking uh, management practices for high pests. Let me see. Uh, okay. Can you explain about the management practice for the high pest and say some idea about the material used for long term high making? Uh, for the long term high making, actually, it's again good, good questions. So we have we have different timber species. Um, uh, uh, in, in Sri Lanka now, uh, because of the costs, people are going for the some way very uh, low quality timber, and as a result, uh, you can you can keep only uh, one or two seasons, right? So then they become decay. But uh, yeah, our uh, um, B Research and Development Institute they are producing hive with good quality timber. So um, uh, th those actually we can keep a lot of them now. Especially I don't know you know kithul plant, the Caryota urens and uh, some uh, like uh, materials also use some people for making hives and then you can keep their colonies for a long time how to overcome wax moth yeah wax moth we tried actually we remove infested uh, infested combs and um, uh, we uh, uh, provide some supplementary feeding and we inspect our colony uh, very frequently and um, uh, if you if you um, if you observe any infested colony, we uh, right away we uh, remove all the the combs. I mean combs, and we then uh, yeah we clean the bottom floor um, and and likewise. So the mainly the clean clean cleanliness will maintain. Uh, but still, um, many farmers are reporting that their colonies are escaping because of the uh, wax moth problem. Uh, so those are the actually uh, we are now thinking about uh, inventing some different other other control strategies uh, applying some smoke as i told you earlier with some tobacco smoking and uh, we were uh, introducing some uh, different um, uh, uh, design or maybe a kind of uh, what you call uh, a net like things in the in the bottom of the uh bottom load right so uh, still those are under experimental level so now and also we are thinking about some uh, pheromone to develop some pheromone traps also but uh, yeah uh, we couldn't have a successful uh, control method so far we are still doing some studies related to that uh actually those are the questions uh, mr jayaprakash uh, so as far i can see uh, those are the questions that I, I think I answered most for most of the questions. Anything else you want to ask? Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, presentation, sir. And thank you for actively participating in uh, the question and answer session also, sir. Uh, okay. Now I invite Dr. T. Rani, uh, co-organizing secretary, to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, 
on behalf of organizing committee and my own personal behalf i thank you dr anurag indrajit sena you have a very good presentation regarding different designing of papery and then with help of enlightened the new research field to the student those are also working at honey bee thank you sir thank you very much and i also appreciate uh, the organizing committee and the, the mr mutukumar and who have uh, invited me for this uh, workshop and uh, for the university uh, the vice chancellor dean and every every academics of the your university i i really appreciate for inviting and i'm i i'm really happy i in, uh, participated in this one and i hope to work with you in the future as well students uh, also um, i think um, uh, please uh, engage with bee keeping nowadays you know the me people are afraid on handling bees and they some people do not like to have bees right and some people are destroying the bees therefore try to conserve them at least uh, uh, ask your kids to uh, maintain at least one colony one day they are in their home guard so in that way we can uh, protect them so thank you very much once again so we will meet some day uh, again so thank you very much thank you sir thank you thank you Uh, dear participants uh, good evening to all uh, so tomorrow we have the two technical session in morning we have the two speakers then afternoon uh, one speaker it's a practical session uh, so please all of you join by 10:20 right we will share the um, um, we will share the link uh, both the youtube as well as the Uh, Zoom link. Please, all of you, join by ten twenty. Thank you.